This episode of the DSP Project is brought to you by PMC, Ultimate Speakers, and Prime Acoustic, take control of your room. Basically, the transmission line has got two forms of loading. Above higher base, it's absorbed. Lower base, it comes out the vent. And you're matching those two levels. And why we call it advanced transmission line is because we've perfected the way those two bands of base match, so they're perfectly flat. Um, and we've also reduced the distortion further. Some of our speakers have little little chambers inside which reduce the distortion even to even lower amounts. Mm. Um, but you know, we're always improving and always developing it. You know, I, I must admit I get bored easily with speakers and I want to move on and do something new. And that's why, you know, every year we come out with something that's perhaps a little bit different or more interesting. You don't want to keep making the same things. It's, uh, I mean, we do make stuff for years, but, but we do keep developing it, you mm. know. So um, often we don't even call it a different model. It's just we, we're just constantly improving the product uh, year on, year on. So to me, that's what turns me on to, you know, improve. So, sorry. Uh, sorry. So talking about um, going forward and um, just uh, I want to talk to you about like a couple different materials and things like you're talking about the, the, the resonance in the cabinet now. Your cabinets, are they made from MDF? They are. That, well, that, HDF, HDF. High density, high density fiber, fiber yeah. board. Um, and so have you, have you guys experimented with um, anything potentially hard like a ceramic or like yeah. this? And uh, have you had any, any good kind of results with that? Still that? like MDF and HDF, they're good materials, very dead. Um, mm -hmm. We've looked at metal cabinets, because some people use metal, but one of the problems is it's just stopping it resonating. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about a uh, high density fiber board is it's very self damping. You know, it, 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 it tends not to take off. The other great byproduct of transmission lines is because you've got this long folded line inside, you've got all these extra partitions inside the cabinet that, that brace all the, all the side mm. walls and the top walls. So the, the cabinet, you know, when you, you know, the old wrap the knuckles test on the box, yeah. it's quite inert, it's, it's quite solid. solid and dead. So, you know, that's, uh, that's almost by default you get that with the transmission line. But uh, no, we, have, we do experiment with different materials and mm. there are a few things that are interesting, but they don't actually bring anything else, you know, any improvement. I mean, they're good probably from a marketing point of view, but they don't actually, don't sound, they any don't actually sound any better. Yeah. A bit like materials for drive units, you know, unfortunately paper's still the stiffest, lightest material on the planet. Mm. And whatever anybody says, I know they all say carbon fiber and, you know, and they are they're all lovely materials, but they aren't actually any stiffer and lighter, which is what you want for a drive unit, than paper. So we still use, a, a, you know, a lot of our speakers, not all of them, but most of them, a, a paper cone, but don't with a, a polymer. But even so, it's still at its core. But it's got not very sexy paper, is no. it? No. Carbon fibre <laughs> sounds much more, sounds much more interesting, impressive. or Kevlar, or, mm. you know, whatever else is, you know. But, but essentially, it performs really well. So we, we try and only use materials if we think they're an advantage. Mm. I, I mean, I think people who use monitors are not stupid. I mean, they, it doesn't matter whether it's got gold on it or anything. I mean, if it doesn't sound any good, you know, yeah, <laughs> you're exactly. going to know, aren't you? And you're living with it. I mean, when you're working on a speaker for hours and hours, you don't want something that's going to tire you or mm. you know, get on your nerves. And um, what about, have you guys experimented with uh, ribbon tweeter technology? That seems something that some people are starting to take up Yeah, now. yeah. Ribbons are very nice, but they, to me, they've got two two problems um, why I've never really adopted them is one is power handling can be an issue you do have to be very protective of them mm. either in the electronics if you've got an active you, you can do that obviously but then you know you might end up into if you're turning it up you might find you're starting to to uh, compress the, the signal to the tweeter to protect it um, the second thing is, is um, I'm very big on dispersion. I mean, I like speakers that are very wide dispersion, horizontally and vertically. And the problem with ribbons is because you, they have to be reasonable lengths to get the power handling, it means the vertical dispersion is compromised. I mean, you know, if you say, say the ribbon's this long, that's like the equivalent of having that diameter tweeter. Mm. And so therefore, if, if you stand up and sit down, the balance can shift because of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the dispersion of the, of the ribbon. And I, I don't really like that. So, mm. you know, most of our speakers, you stand, if you're at a desk and you stand up and sit down or you move around, the image pretty well stays the same balance and where it sits. 
Whereas, you know, if I used a tweeter that was that long, you know, that wouldn't be the case. The balance would shift. So I personally don't like it. Um, I mean, there are I mean, some beautiful designs with ribbons. I mean, not, not, don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking anybody who's ribbons. I, you know, they're an interesting, you know, comp yeah. you know that, but that's their design. See, every designer's got his own sort of bees in his bonnet, really. You know, there's yeah. certain things that you feel strongly about. Now, another designer might say, well, I know, I know that's its weakness, but actually what it gives me, I, I like this more than the weakness. Because every speaker is a balance of all these different, you know, performances, mm. you know. And um, I mean, ribbons are very popular in hi-fi, for example, because most people sit in the same place, so it doesn't really matter. You know, they're not going to be bobbing, they're not going to be moving. Whereas in a, in a recording environment or studio environment, you do move. So to me, it's more important that, you know, the image stays the same. Mm. Yeah, I definitely know what you mean by the dispersion. Like, uh, I recently was listening to uh, your fact dates, which are fairly yeah, new. They are. Thing, and the phenomenal the dispersion on those, it's, mm. it's just... We um, we did a shootout with that against um, uh, another brand of speaker, um, yeah. which I can't even remember the name of now. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but it was yeah. it was really impressive. It was like the whole thing in comparison yes. yeah. opened up. Yeah. Um, so uh, talking about the um, I'm talking about and I shouldn't be talking about hi-fi speakers because this is a like a, a studio I show. Yeah. So forgive me. Uh, <laughs> I'll get I'll get hate mail. Um, but uh, <laughs> what is the what is the main difference in your eyes, well, in, as far as PMC's philosophy goes, between a hi-fi speaker and a studio speaker? Um, well, I usually get shot for saying this, but no, there's no difference. It's the same. You're trying to make an accurate speaker. That's all I feel like. Mm. Um, I know some people think that that's not true. I mean, obviously, in the pro environment, reliability and uh, you know, and perhaps maximum sound pressure levels are moved up the list of priorities, perhaps to the home. But to be honest, that's changed because people at home like listening at high levels. If they've got home cinema, they certainly like it to shake the floor. Um, they want them to be reliable, so really that that even that argument's a weak one. So for mm -hmm. me, ever since we started, we've always made speakers that work in both environments. Probably the only difference is probably the finish. You know, mm -hmm. most studios would rather have a, a simple paint finish and save some money than have some exotic veneer which somebody might like in their home. But the actual drive units and design and everything is identical, um, and I think that's important because otherwise, you know, if you're a company. You know, if you're selling a product and you're saying this is right, how can that be right if you're making another product that's different? Mm. You know, I mean, which one's right? Um, I mean, a lot of hi-fi speakers certainly bend the frequency response so it sounds kind of nice and cuddly in the home. And there's a lot of those people. And I can, under I can relate to why they do that because obviously they sell speakers and, uh, and it, sounds, it makes everything sound nice. Well, I don't, I personally, I don't want to go down that path. I want it to be accurate. So they're enjoying it how it should sound. And there's no need to go to those tricks. There are a lot of tricks you can do in speakers. You can put little bumps in the response to make everything sound lovely and sparkly and sound as if it's got more detail. And it hasn't really. It's just a, it's a psychoacoustic trick. And um, I, I don't personally want to go down that path because you never, you, 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 you've got nothing to build on next time. You know, I mean, to us, we're always improving what we do. And if you haven't got that goal, I don't think you really... I don't think you will produce a better speaker next time. You'll just produce a, a different one mm. because you're you're not really improving the real pr reproduction. So accuracy is a big thing for us, and that applies to pro as well as consumer. It does make some of our speakers for the pro world more expensive, but you know that's unfortunately a byproduct of the complexity of the cabinet and the crossovers because the crossovers are quite complex in our speakers because we want to get that um, dispersion working vertically as well as horizontally um, so again you know it's a it's a that's a choice thing really for the designer on what he feels is important mm. but so far it seems to be working fantastic <laughs> it does first 20 years anyway yeah. first 20 years ago yeah, well. absolutely and uh, late, later <clears> this year because it's our 20th anniversary we're going to start offering a 20-year warranty oh really yeah well, that's, uh, that's that's a pretty you decent warranty first. yeah yeah well we've 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 been making speakers 20 years and we've analyzed because we analyze all the warranty repairs and all what goes wrong with the products over 20 years we still we can still maintain every speaker we've built for the last 20 years we have spares for them we have all the records for them so anybody who's bought a product from us can have it repaired um, but then we started looking at, and we actually realized that very very little of our speakers 
our true warranty failures, you know, failures because we've made it wrong or the, the, you know, the cabinet's deteriorated or the drivers have gone wrong through no fault of the user. Most, most, drive, most speaker failures are because somebody's had a bit of an accident in the studio, you know. Mm. Somebody's left the mic open and slammed the door or something, you know, or mm. whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so we feel pretty confident. I think that will give our customers the confidence that they know that we mean business, that we're not going to make a speaker for a year and then not support it. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, coming back to what I was saying before about the, how you're testing, not only are you testing each part, but also the, the tolerance of each part. Yeah. But I say you've actually got a record of, oh, yeah. of the tolerance yeah. of each part yeah. for each yeah. speaker. That's right. You so could, if, you, you, if you blow a little, uh, you know, whatever it is, a Panasonic doodly bob yeah. thing, you actually know that's the right. exact tolerance of that. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, yeah. that, that's pretty impressive. We're again. not that anal, really. <laughs> 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 no. But I mean, we do do that because, you know, you can find out with the zero number anyway, and, and we'll, we can match whatever it is that's gone in that speaker. And that that's is important. Hmm. I think. Well, you know, I mean, especially in studios, it's 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 a tool. It's a, it's part of your it's your professional equipment. You know, hmm. it's not you know it's not just some something you throw away when you finish it. I mean, it is your uh, you know it's what allows you to do your job properly. And you want to know that if anything goes wrong with you, you can get it repaired. First of all, you get it repaired, even if you've bought it five or ten years ago. But you also want to know that it's going to sound the same. You don't have to relearn the speaker again, do you? Hmm. So I think it is pretty important, uh, and and of course you can get it repaired quickly, um, and you know we've you might notice, but you know all our speakers are pretty modular. The actual time it takes to assemble our speakers is incredibly small because it's basically a cabinet, the drive units, and a crossover module with the connectors on it. So it all bolts together pretty quick. So that means if any bit goes wrong, it's very quick to repair. You know, some people put the crossovers inside the cabinet, and you know, all hardwire it, and it, it's a nightmare to replace. With Whereas all our speakers are, are very quick to, to repair. But to be honest, Touchwood, you know, we don't have an awful lot that fails. So, mm. you know, it's not a big issue. And that's why we decided to offer the warranty, because to be honest, I think we're pretty confident. You know, mm. So, so um, yeah, 20 years, that's quite exciting. So looking going forward, how about giving us a scoop as to the next uh, PMC product that you guys are working on? Secretly cool. in the lab Next. that nobody else knows about. Well, uh, well, I suppose it'd have to be a pro product, wouldn't it? Really, I mean, there are. I mean, we've got. I mean, every year we bring out a pro and a consumer product. Um, um, so you probably for this audience, probably pro would be more interesting than that. Yeah, okay. Come on, tell us about the pro. Two right? actives, two new actives. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, should be out the end of this, probably October, November. I hope. How big? Um, one small. Um, Active speaker for the uh, DSP crossover digital power amps, and then one about so be about 200 by 300 by 400 millimeter. So one will have a seven inch woofer, one will have a five and a half inch woofer. Mm -hmm. and, and what's the um, uh, what's the evolution of these products? Um, a long one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you might have uh, seen that we developed some speakers for DigiDesign. Uh, digital editing guys um, for the states. We we designed their two monitors for them, RM1, RM2s, and they were um, our first foray into to digital development. Really doing crossover in the digital domain, seeing what we could do. Really in terms of, I mean, so many people have done digital speakers, and it strikes me they've always taken really god awful speak drive units and everything, and then tried to sort of straighten it out in DSP, hmm. and. You know, you, you can't actually make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, or however clever the electronics are. And we thought, well, if you take a really good design, then apply DSP to it, then, you know, hopefully you will. And it really does seem, you know, we seem to have got a performance out of these speakers that's pretty exciting for me. And the DigiDesign ones were kind of the first, you know, um, first go at that, really, with them. And that was an interesting project. Um, so it's a kind of, we're moving on from that really. And this year we launched a big three-way, um, the IB2 XBD, which is a fully active speaker. And that's all digital as well. So interesting time. So um, when you say um, it's, it's got a digital crossover and you yeah. say it's co completely digital, does that mean it's actually got a digital input? On it's got the... analog and digital inputs, yeah. Right, so it's got its own converter. Yep. It's got a DAC built yeah, in. Yeah, 24-bit. 24-bit yeah. DAC hmm. plus digital crossover amplifier, yep. all in the cabinet. All in the cabinet, yeah, all integrated. 
I see. So yeah, quite a package. So you could you could go sort of uh, digital out of your your interface straight yeah, into straight into, straight into your yeah. monitors. Yeah. Ooh, nice. Quite good. Isn't that, it? that sounds quite interesting. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, this has been the most most enlightening. Okay. Thank you very much okay. um, uh, for coming on the show. No problem. And uh, that is it for this week for the DSP project. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please head on down to the DSPproject.com and leave uh, a comment underneath this video. Uh, until next time, we'll see you later.